Hello, thank you very much for having me as a speaker. My name is Omar Tariq and I'll be talking about basics of vascular imaging. I'll be talking about various pathologies of aorta, pulmonary artery. We'll be talking about different types of vasculitides, mesenteric vessels, pelvic and extremity pathologies, and renal pathologies. So starting with aorta. So just quickly, we know about the normal branching anatomy, which is seen in 66% of population. We have a three-vessel arch. The most common anomaly is the bovine aortic arch when there is a common origin of a brachiocephalic artery and left common carotid artery. It is seen in 13% of the patients, more commonly in Blacks. Uh, it's incorrectly referred as a bovine aortic arch because the true bovine aortic arch, which is seen in cattle, it just has a single great vessel arising from the aortic arch and all the great vessels arise from that. Four vessel arch is the next most common one, which is seen in 6% of the population. In this case, there is direct origin of the left vertebral artery from the aorta, and uh, the left vertebral artery is the third aortic branch proximal to the left subclavian. Hybrid right subclavian artery that is seen in 1% of the patients. This is, happens when right subclavian artery arises directly from the aortic arch, distal to the left subclavian and loops behind the esophagus on its way to the right arm. So a related pathology to this is a dysphagia lusoria. This happens when uh, there's esophageal compression resulting in dysphagia from the aberrant right subclavian artery. When you do a barium esophagogram, you can see a posterior indentation on the esophagus. It's very important to mention the presence of aberrant right subclavian artery. If a thyroid surgery is planned, then the recurrent laryngeal nerve might not be at its usual location. And also sometimes what you can see is a small bulge at the region of aberrant right subclavian artery. It's known as comeral's diverticulum. We talked about uh, aortic anatomy. We will be talking about different aortic syndromes. So starting with penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer. Penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer happens when uh, an atherosclerotic plaque penetrates the intima and it ulcerates into the media, but the adventitia layer is intact. So moving on to intramural hematoma. Intramural hematoma happens when there is rupture of vasa visorum, which creates a crescent-shaped hemorrhage limited within the medial layer. It may be associated with an aneurysm. Now in the example, this is a non-contrast CT scan. You can see this uh, hyperdense crescent here. And on the contrast-enhanced axial CT scan, you can see this relatively hypodense, non-enhancing component, which represents an intramural hematoma. Dissection is when intima is disrupted, typically by an ulcerative plaque, could happen from trauma and aneurysm too. Uh, there is an intimal medial flap which is created, and the media is then dissected, and there is creation of a false lumen. Blood flows slower in the false lumen, and sometimes it can be thrombosed, but typically it, it enhances less as compared to the true lumen. Now, this is a perfect example of a aortic dissection. This is the intimal medial flap we were talking about. Now, moving on to the types of aortic dissection. Typically, we have Stanford A and Stanford B. Stanford A is when it arises from the descending thoracic aorta. It can or cannot involve the descending thoracic aorta. Then we have the Stanford B aortic dissection, in which case it arises from the descending thoracic aorta. So the question is, why do we have a differentiation of type A versus type B? Type A is considered emergent because there is urgent surgical management that is needed. Because it arises in the ascending thoracic aorta, it can cause coronary artery occlusion. It can rupture into the pericardium, which can result in a tamponade. It can also cause dissection into the aortic valve, resulting in aortic insufficiency. The big question is, what do we call an aortic dissection that arises? Arises in the arch of aorta. So this was a very good paper that talks about any dissection that arises in the aortic arch is not a type A, it is type B because we typically don't have to worry about the complications that are typically associated with type A. So comparing the intramural hematoma with the aortic dissection, the intramural hematoma with, would have a fixed crescent shaped that would be hypodense and enhanced on CT angio. There will not be any internal flap, whereas in aortic dissection, there will be a false lumen, which will be partially, partly enhancing unless it's thrombosed and there will be an internal flap. Again, this is a very good example of uh, an intramural hematoma. As you can see, it's crescent shaped uh, on non-contrast images, it's hyperdense, whereas in contrast enhanced images, it doesn't enhance that much. Moving on to pulmonary artery pathologies, starting with pulmonary hypertension, you will see an increase in diameter of main pulmonary artery equal or greater than 
2.9 centimeter. Also, the main pulmonary artery diameter will be greater than the aortic root diameter. Pulmonary artery calcifications are also known for chronic pulmonary artery hypertension. Uh, in addition, you can also see mosaic attenuation. You can also see ground glass central lobular nodules and acuses. Moving on to pulmonary AVM, when there is an abnormal connection between pulmonary artery and pulmonary vein, uh, we call it a pulmonary AVM. It causes a right to left shunt. When there are multiple pulmonary AVMs, we call them as hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, also known as osler weber rendu syndrome. It can typically present with brain abscess, stroke, or recurrent epistaxis. For treatment of pulmonary AVM, place coils to embolize them. Uh, particles are typically contraindicated as there is a right to left shunt, which would cause brain emboli and infarction. Um, indication for treatment, if it's an asymptomatic lesion, you need the feeding artery to be greater than three millimeter in size. And for sim any symptomatic lesion, if the patient has a prior infarct or a brain abscess. Moving on to vasculitis. So vasculitis, all of them, they pretty much have a lot of overlapping findings. The most important thing is age and regional distribution. These are all the different vasculitides that we will be talking about, starting with large vessel vasculitides. So aortitis in an acute phase, it will show circumferential mural thickening and enhancement. There may be associated aneurysm or dissection. Typically, aortic wall thickness will be greater than two millimeter and there will be enhancement of the aortic wall. Takayasu is also known as pulseless disease. It typically involves the aorta, coronary arteries, subclavian arteries, carotid arteries, pulmonary arteries, and large mesenteric arteries. It's typically seen in women aged less than 50. In this case, you will see a long smooth stenosis, which is classic. Imaging wise, it's indistinguishable from giant cell arthritis. So this is a perfect example of Takayasu arthritis. Here you see long smooth stenosis of the great vessels. Here you see long smooth stenosis of the aorta. So moving on to giant cell arthritis, also known as temporal arthritis. In this case, the patient's age will be greater than 50. There is typically involvement of extra cranial head and neck arteries. Upper extremities are commonly affected, especially subclavian, axillary, and brachial arteries. Aorta is rarely involved. It is Aorta is typically involved in Takaya Souza arthritis. And again, you will see long segment stenosis and occlusions. It can typically present with headaches, polymyalgia, visual changes. Definitive diagnosis is with temporal artery biopsy and treatment is steroids. Moving on to Bessette's. Bessettes will typically present with multiple pulmonary artery aneurysms, typically seen in young male. Moving on to small and medium vessels, we divide these into two groups, NCA positive and NCA negative. NCA positive will include polyarthritis nodosa, Wegner cremotosis, Church stress syndrome, Kawasaki disease. So polyarthritis nodosa, as we know, TNK will be elevated. We will see multiple visceral aneurysms. Moving on to Wegner's. Wegner's, you can see cavitary lesions in the lungs. You will see septal perforation. There will be tracheal stenosis, Church stress syndrome. You will typically see this in the lungs. There will be multifocal consolidation, ground glass opacities, multiple nodules. The last one of these is Kawasaki disease, in which case you will see multiple coronary artery um, aneurysms. Moving on to Berger's disease. Berger's disease will affect lower extremities. It's typically seen as we know in adult male smokers. The primary treatment is uh, smoking cessation. You will see uh, segmental stenosis of the medium and small arteries in the leg. It's typically described as corkscrew collaterals will be seen in the vas azorum. Moving on to mesenteric vessels, starting with splenic artery aneurysm, the indication for treatment of a splenic artery aneurysm is uh, when there is aneurysm size of greater than 2.5 centimeter or prior to expected pregnancy. These are known to rupture during pregnancy or if the patient is symptomatic with the left upper quadrant pain. The treatment of choice is endovascular coil embolization. It's the most common visceral aneurysm. It's typically seen in multiparous females and patients with portal hypertension. They're at increased risk. There is increased risk of rupture during pregnancy. Moving on to median arcuate ligament syndrome, or also known as Dunbar syndrome. This happens when there is a celiac artery compression by median arcuate ligament, which typically worsens with expiration. It's typically asymptomatic, present with crampy abdominal pain. The treatment is surgical relief of the median arcuate ligament. Again, this is a very good example showing median arcuate uh, ligament syndrome. Uh, these are the sagittal images in deep inspiration, and these are the sagittal images in deep expiration showing worsening of the compression of the celiac artery origin. Multiple additional examples showing 
compression of the celiac artery origin. Moving on to SMS syndrome, also known as Volkhi syndrome. This happens when there is significant compression of the diodenum between aorta and the spiromesenteric artery. It's typically seen in thin children, bun victims, or patients who have lost a lot of weight recently. Mm -hmm. This is just a cartoon depicting the same phenomena. On an upper GI, you will see significant compression of the diodenum, multiple additional images showing the same phenomena on a CAT scan. For diagnosis, they typically suggest looking at aortic mesenteric angle. You measure this angle, and if there is a significant reduction of the angle and there is decrease in aortic mesenteric distance, that represents the pathology. Moving on to Nutcracker syndrome. Nutcracker syndrome happens when there's compression of the left renal vein between aorta and spiromesenteric artery. You will see pain, hematuria, orthostatic proteinuria, pelvic congestion, and varicoceles. Majority of the cases of hematuria resolve within two years of observation. If treatment is desired, the typical treatment is angioplasty and stenting of the renal vein. So basically, going back to the previous cartoon, in the SMA syndrome, the diornum is compressed in Nutcracker syndrome. It's the left renal vein, which is being compressed between the spiromesenteric artery and the aorta. So this is another example in which we see multiple enlarged gonadal veins and uh, large periuterine vessels. You see this large gonadal vein, multiple periuterine venous plexus. This is all collateral circulation because of significant compression of the left renal vein between the spermesenteric artery and the aorta. So the treatment is typically angioplasty and stent placement. Moving on to pelvic and extremity vessels, starting with Lariche syndrome. It's a chronic occlusive atherosclerotic disease of the distal abdominal aorta. It typically presents with impotence, but a claudication, absent femoral pulses, and cold lower extremities. As you can see, there will be complete occlusion of the distal abdominal aorta. There is no contrast going into that region. Moving on to May-Turner syndrome. May-Turner syndrome is typically when there is venous thrombosis of the left common iliac vein caused by compression by the crossing right common iliac artery. Treatment is typically thrombolysis followed by stenting. It's a perfect example. As you can see on the axial contrast enhanced image, there is a thrombosis of the left common iliac vein because of compression by the crossing right common iliac artery. Treatment, like I said, is thrombolysis followed by a stent placement. Moving on to pelvic congestion syndrome, it's a non-cyclical chronic pelvic pain caused by dilatation of the uterus and ovarian plexus. It's accompanied by dilated, tortuous, and congested veins caused by retrograde flow through the incompetent ovarian vein valves. So what you will typically see in is there will be significant dilatation of the ovarian veins, secondary to valve failure and uh, obstruction. There will be uh, significant varicosities in the periuterine region. So typically, you treat it with coil embolization of both gonadal veins. So this is an example showing coil embolization of a gonadal vein, you started with the left side and then you collabolized the other side. Moving on to popliteal entrapment syndrome. Popliteal entrapment syndrome is when there is completion of the popliteal artery by a calf muscle or fibrous band, and the treatment is surgical release. As shown in this image, you will see it worsening in active plant refraction, and it will be better uh, with passive dorsiflexion. Moving on to cystic adventitial disease, it's a rare cause of distal claudication when one or more mucoid cysts are present in the adventitia surrounding the popliteal artery, resulting in significant luminal compression and treatment is surgical resection. Thoracic Albert syndrome is typically accompanied by compression of brachial plexus, subclavian artery or subclavian vein. When the vein is thrombosed, it's called Paget-Trotter syndrome. It will be typically accompanied with upper extremity paresthesia, pain, numbness, and coolness. So the important thing about thoracic outlet syndrome is that there is this interscalene triangles, brachial plexus and subclavian artery pass through the interscalene triangle, whereas subclavian vein does not pass through the interscalene triangle, but it runs anterior to the anterior scalene muscle and posterior to the subclavius muscle. Treatment is thrombolysis. If it doesn't improve with thrombolysis, then a surgery might be needed. Moving on to hypothene or hammer syndrome. In this case, injury to ulnar artery happens when it crosses the hammered bone from chronic repetitive trauma. Perfect scenario is a jackhammer operator with ischemia of fourth and fifth digits. On um, angio, you will see occlusion of the ulnar artery with distal embolic occlusion. Multiple additional examples showing ulnar artery occlusion in the case of hypothenar hammer syndrome. This green circle shows how it should look, whereas all these red circles show pathology of the ulnar artery, either there is significant stenosis or occlusion. Moving on to renal vessels, we will be talking about fibromuscular dysplasia. It's an idiopathic vascular disease affecting primarily renal and carotid arteries. It affects middle or distal third of the 
renal arteries. This is an example, as you can see, the perfect beaded appearance of the fibromuscular dysplasia. The treatment is simply angioplasty without stenting. And that concludes the session. Thank you.